Hi, I'm Brandon. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I usually, I haven't gotten one of those before, so that was cool. Um, so I work with Rahul, right? Uh, but today we're going to talk about something um, different, I guess. We're going to go beyond types, all right? So let's say we want to design an API for some library, OK? It can be anything. Think of anything in your head. It doesn't matter. I think no matter what, uh, these two things are important. You want to minimize complexity, you want to keep it simple, and you want to maximize expressivity, all right? And I think we can actually measure these things. I think we can measure complexity uh, by, by counting the number of exposed primitives on the public interface of your API. And, and here, by primitive, I, I couldn't think of a better word. I mean a type, a method, a parameter inside of a method, an error code, a function, anything that someone has to think about when they, when they uh, look at your API, OK? Um, and then expressivity uh, is proportional to the number of solutions to problems that your API uh, exposes to, to your consumers, OK? And even solutions, different solutions to the same problem, all right? Uh, so cool. So uh, unfortunately, we get this trade off here, OK? And I drew this thing uh, with, a, with the program, uh, not with my fingers. Um, but <laughs> so, so if, if we look here, expressivity is on the x-axis, complexity is on the y-axis, uh, and I don't know enough calculus to draw like too complicated of a line here, but um, this green line is what I would say is the naive way of, of adding expressivity to an API. So let's say we want to um, model like uh, uh, cars driving or something. So we have this like all these methods to drive cars, and then we're like, hey, I also want to drive helicopters. And we had all these methods to drive helicopters, and we had all these methods to drive trucks. And, and we just add more and more and more stuff to the interface, so the complexity shoots up. Okay? Um, but I want to talk about this red line. Okay? So I want to talk about something where, um, at a certain point, we get expressivity for free without ever increasing complexity. Um, and in reality, this line should probably curve up at some point. But hopefully, that, that kind of makes sense. Um, and I'll be more concrete, obviously, as this goes on. Uh, so, so we can do this with composable APIs, all right? Um, just think of a composable, for those that don't know, um, composable API is one that like, uh, operates on some type uh, in maybe multiple ways and returns that same type. So then you can take that result and like, recombine it. Um, so I believe that composable APIs maximize expressivity and simplicity. They, they minimize complexity while giving us a ton of expressive power. All right? So, to be finally concrete, um, we're going to talk about folding things today, all right? Uh, and I don't mean pieces of paper. I mean taking a lot of things and smashing them into one thing, all right? So for example, I can take a lot of integers and smash them into one integer by adding them all, all right? Uh, and sometimes I might want to sum like 40 billion integers, okay? Uh, and pretend there's no overflow. Uh, but this, is, this could be slow. So maybe we want to sum two things at the same time. So if I have two cores on my phone, I can sum half on one thread, half on the other thread. When I get the results, I can uh, then you know, add those last two numbers together. Okay? And I've sort of doubled my performance. Um, but, but this is not super interesting, because we don't really ever want to add 40 billion integers, I guess. Um, but we do want to combine things sometimes. So, so what I want to talk about is folding things uh, in a simple and expressive way that, that takes a lot of things, summarizes them into one thing. And it's not specialized for one kind of thing. Right? It works on all sorts of types and all sorts of operations. And, and in particular, it, it knows about the constraints of your operations to optimize itself. Okay? So now we can begin. Um, we're going to talk about a closed binary operation. Okay? Uh, so we can define an operator in Swift. Uh, and, and we can define a function on that operator that takes two things of some type, returns one thing of that same type, so it's composable. And, and, and we can implement this for any type A, right? So we can, have, we can add integers, we can concatenate strings, um, and, and, then, and then we can use this by, by uh, if we have you know, values x, y, and z of, of that type, we can just stick these diamond operators in between them, and they all smash together, OK? Uh, and, and in particular, um, the word closed uh, is kind of important. Um, in this context, it just means don't crash, basically, uh, and, and you know, behave as a functional programmer. Okay? So, 
So what, what I want to do now is I want to talk about these things in, like, I want to take a step back and talk about all of them at the same time. So I'm going to use protocols, OK? And unfortunately, this operation is so abstract that coming up with a name is sort of hard. So uh, I'm going to pick this name, Magma. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't come up with this name, but it's important, OK? And I'll explain why. Uh, but we're going to call it a Magma. And what I've done is I've taken this free function that took two parameters of the same type, and I've lifted it into a method where one of those parameters is the target that the method's being invoked on, and the other one is the parameter. Okay? And then it's returning self again, so it's, it's still that same, like, take two things and return one thing of that same type. All right? So this is, this is saying the exact same thing. Um, and, and of course, we can implement that operator again. Uh, and and for, for anything that conforms to magma, which is cool, uh, where we just invoke that operation. Right? So for visual people, do this thing. If in the universe of operations, some of those are closed binary operations, and we're going to call those magmas. All right? Uh, and then a thing on the name, this guy came up with the name in 1926, according to Wikipedia. Uh, his name is Heinrich Brandt. Sorry for the people who can pronounce that better than I. Um, and uh, the picture is old, right? Because this person, you know, came up with this stuff a long time ago, like 100 years ago. So uh, naming things is hard, right? And, and if, we, if we take these names that the mathematicians came up with, like, a long time ago, we can basically... Uh, take advantage of all their research, you know? So, so I think we should do that. So let's, let's keep doing that. All right, what's a magma? Uh, an example of one. A sum, summing integers, OK? Uh, so instead of just uh, adding an extension to integer, I'm going to wrap it up in a struct to give it a fresh name, because there might be multiple ways to define this operation on integers, OK? So, so this is just one particular way, so I'm wrapping it up in a, in a struct. And the implementation of this operation just uh, it, it, if you look inside the, the sum wrapper here, it just adds the two values together and then wraps it back up. OK? It's very simple. Um, and then, then when we use this, we just say, I have one, I have another one, I can combine them, and then uh, I get two, right? One plus one is two. And if you're staring at this, at this point, uh, most of you should probably be, uh, or will probably be thinking, like, this is, this is stupid, I guess. You know, like, What's the point of all this? Uh, and and I, I, want to, I want to take a second and think about why. Okay? And I think the reason why you could be thinking that is because I've added a type, I've added complexity to the system, and I have not increased expressivity. I haven't showed you how we can use this to do something more interesting than just what the plus operator already gives us. Okay? So I want to do that. Okay? Um, we can define a fold that works on every single magma in the universe, OK? So what this fold does is it takes an empty, something to do if you misbehave and don't pass anything else, uh, and then a lot of stuff, so like our 40 billion integers that we want to sum. And then, and then what it does is it just invokes reduce on, on that piece of work with a base case of empty and, and a combination function of just calling that operation, uh, OK? So this is, this is it. We can fold things now, right? But, but if, you, if you look at this, it's not that fast, right? It doesn't take advantage of our multi-core processors. And it's not super simple either. Like, what exactly does that empty do? You know, like, like what are valid empties, right? So I want to simplify it. And here's where it gets crazy. Laws. OK. The journey. Our journey begins. Uh, <laughs> so. What's a law? A law is an equivalence between two programs that should always be true. OK? Uh, and if that doesn't make sense, here are some examples. Associativity is an example. OK? If you recall from high school, uh, you may have learned that integers under addition um, are associative in this way. If I first add x and y um, and then z, it's the same as first adding y and z and then x. OK? Um, and, and I showed an example here of 1, 2, and 3. This equals 6 on both sides. But it's important to, to realize that this, this equation holds no matter what x, y, and z are. OK? Um, and, and what we can do as programmers is we can, we can swap out the plus for our diamond. OK? And, and now we have a program on the left, we have a program on the right, and we're saying uh, if our operation is associative, then this law, this equivalence between these two programs will hold. 
if I combine x and y first and then z, it's the same as combining y and z first and then x, as long as the order is the same. Uh, so so if, we, if we have this law, OK, and we have a magma, um, mathematicians have, this, have a term for this. It's called a semigroup. And, and in Swift, we can say a semigroup is a magma by using protocol inheritance. And, and we can stick this law on the top uh, with a comment, all right? <laughs> um, and I'm glad you all laughed, because you might laugh, right? But this is not something that I am saying, you know, I'm making up like, hey, you need to go read these comments in order to do this thing that I'm talking about. Because you already need to do that. If you look at the documentation for equatable, whenever you, whenever you implement an equals equals operator in Swift, your equals equals better behave uh, according to these three laws. And if it doesn't, things will be broken. All right? And I'm not going to go over all of them, but one of them, for example, is for any value A, if A equals equals A uh, is invoked, it needs to return true, no matter what. Okay? If, if you ever return false there, bad, bad. So, <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not, I, I hope that, like, you understand, like, I'm not making this idea up. It's something that you already should, should be thinking about. And now you will, hopefully. So, uh, again, if you're, if you're a visual person, I just want to stress uh, a semigroup is a subset of the universe of magmas, just as magmas are a subset of all the operations. All right? So, what's an example of a semigroup? A sum. That's, we already defined that, um, and, and the reason is because uh, I, I already talked about how adding integers is associative, all right? Um, and up to this point in the talk, you should all be questioning the whole purpose of this, because <laughs> so far, I don't think anything like super interesting has happened, but I hope that it is about to, okay? Why should you care about this stuff? And this is what I think is important. This is, we actually can get something out of this, all right? The fact that sum is a semigroup means we get expressive power for free, okay? Now, assuming you know what these words mean, okay, they apply across all domains. So it's not specific to folding things. And what we get out of being a semigroup is we have the freedom to chunk work up, okay? So, so we can have a helper function that combines two things, and then later we combine with a third thing and reuse that code. Or if it's cleaner, we can do it all in one line. Okay? And, and the important thing is it's up to the consumer of the API to decide what's best for them, what will, what will uh, result in the cleanest code. Okay? Um, and and what's, what's even more interesting is as a corollary to this, uh, I can choose how to chunk up the work in the implementation of fold or anything else. And I can say anything that's associative, I can, uh, in, I can execute, evaluate uh, in parallel. Okay? Because I can just choose to... Uh, re, you know, redo the parentheses and, and evaluate this chunk on one thread, this chunk on another thread, and then combine the results at the end. Okay? Uh, and, and so what we can do with that is we can increase the performance of fold. All right? And, and we can make fold par. So fold par takes uh, what to do when there's nothing, the empty still, a bunch of work, and this time also a dispatch queue. Uh, and, and what we do is at first we split the work into pairs. And then if we have one left over, we can use the empty. And then, we, uh, and then we dispatch async everything. And then we get results. We split into pairs again. And we keep doing that over and over and over again until we're done. And, and what that gives us is uh, we've, we've decreased the span, which is the runtime on some hypothetical infinite core processor, from, from O of n to O of log n. All right? Uh, and, and another thing that's cool is like this works on every single semigroup. If you have an operation and it's associative, this will work, OK? So you might be saying, hey, let's make everything semigroups, because it's awesome to do things in parallel, you know? Um, but we can't, because there are some operations that are not associative. There are some magmas that are not semigroups, OK? This is an example of one, subtraction over integers, all right? Uh, if, we, if we look at this, this is saying for all x, y, and z that are integers, x minus y minus z is the same as x minus y minus z. Uh, and this is not true. You can just plug in 1, 2, and 3, and you get negative 4 and 2. And then it's false. So subtraction is not a semigroup. All right? Uh, but there's more laws. We, we don't have to stop there. Uh, there's this, I don't know the proper name for this, so excuse me, but I call it the left-right identity law. All right? Uh, and, and what this says is that if I have some empty element, uh, and I combine it on the left with 
any element x, I get back x. Uh, if, I, if I take this empty element and I combine it on the right, I get back x, right? So it's as if I had not combined anything at all. And, and if, we, if we plug in 0 and 1, then uh, we can show that 0 behaves like this empty in this way. Because adding 0 on the left or the right still results in 1. OK? Um, and, and at this point, you should ask again, what's the point of this? What is the expressive power that I gain if my operation has this identity that behaves in this way? Um, and there is something. Uh, so it's a power I like to call drop the optional. All right? So if you have some function or some method that annoyingly needs an optional for some reason, because let's say you're doing something in a condition, uh, and then you need to have some other case, right? Uh, you, can, uh, you can choose to promote that nil into an empty, and then you can simplify the type signature. Okay? Or if you have something that's already optional, you can, you can coerce it. Uh, you can use the, the nil coalescing operator to uh, fall back to the empty. And, and again, this is not something that you have to do, but uh, the client, the consumers of your API have the ability to do this now. They have, they have more power to write cleaner code. Okay? Um, so we have an identity, and we have a semigroup. Then mathematicians have this word called a monoid. Okay? Uh, and all a monoid is, is it's uh, everything a magma is, that's the operation. It's everything a semigroup is, which is the associativity. And it's also uh, this extra identity law, which requires us to refer to some element empty, which means we must, we must declare what empty means. And it will be different for every type. So we're including it in the protocol. OK? Uh, so, so again, for, for visual people, a monoid is a subset of semigroups. Okay? It's all the semigroups that also happen to have an identity. Right? Uh, and then again, our sum is a monoid. We already talked about that. Zero is uh, an example empty that behaves. Um, and we already showed it's a semigroup, and we already showed the magma. But uh, maybe a little bit more interesting, two sums is a monoid. We can take two sums and group them together in a struct. And we can set the empty to uh, the individual sums being empty, so two zeros. And then the operation that combines them just uh, adds the, the two pieces of information. Okay? And, uh, and I don't have time to actually go through the proof of this, but uh, this, is, this is a monoid. Okay? So the identity holds and associativity holds. And actually, you can take any two monoids and group them together, and that results in a monoid. So uh, unfortunately, it's a bit hard to express that in Swift, but um, we can just hard code it for, for our two sums. And you might be thinking, why is two sums more interesting than one sum? Uh, and it is, because it can model the arithmetic mean. We can, we can think about averages. So we, we can have the first sum actually summing over elements that we want to average, and the second one is a count. And at any point in time, we can query this thing and say, hey, take your total sum and divide it by the count and give me the current mean. All right? So, so now you can think about that as another example for our fold. All right? Uh, but, but monoid, being a monoid, actually helps our fold as well. We can simplify the API. We can remove a parameter. And, and, and it still works in the same way, OK? So, so we used to have this empty as, as this first parameter. And, and there was this um, implicit dependency that empty worked in the way that we needed it to to get the fold to behave, OK? But now, now that, that implicit dependency, of that understanding that all, uh, that all users of this method, who, everyone who invokes it has to understand, um, is gone, OK? The only person or persons that have to understand it are those that maintain the actual type that conforms to the monoid, OK? And, and this, this right identity is really important for this to work in the way that I described before. So but running things in parallel is cool. But we can also distribute the work across different phones, OK? So, so uh, think about, um, uh, we're going to talk about smartphones by their IP addresses, right? And, uh, and we can take our 40 billion integers or whatever and, and distribute the work evenly across the machines. Every device does some work and then sends it back, and we can add them together, uh, or combine them in whatever way we want. OK? Now, there's more laws. Commutativity. Commutativity says, I can combine x with y, um, and, and that's the same as combining y with x. OK? So, uh, and now think again. What is the expressive power I gain if my operation is commutative? Because that's, that's what's important. And, and the power you get is that operations can be reordered. OK? So, so here's a simple example. I have some fields. I'm going to call it combined. Started at empty. And then uh, I have this, like, this function that gets called randomly that gives me a new integer that I want to sum. And they might be out of order, but it doesn't matter. I don't have to care about the order. I can just take it and combine it into my 
big aggregate combined thing, all right? Uh, if, if we think, what do the mathematicians call this thing? They got super lazy here uh, and just said commutative monoid, commutative monoid, that's what we're going to call it. Um, and, and this, again, it's a, it's a monoid, right? It has all the things a monoid has, which means it has all the things a semigroup has, um, and it has this extra law commutativity, all right? Uh, in a picture, it's a subset of all the monoids in the universe, okay? Um, two sums is a commutative monoid, uh, and the intuition is adding is commutative. I'm not going to do a formal proof, but uh, there's another example. Um, and, then, and then we can improve the, the, uh, the expressiveness of our fold. We can make the fold a little bit better. What we can do is uh, when we distribute our work, if, if some of the phones are iPhone 4s, okay, and some of them are 7 pluses, uh, the 7 pluses will probably finish first. And what we can do, because it's commutative, is we can always show the current incremental result in some user interface. And we can only do that because we have the ability to reorder the operations however we want. All right? Uh, and that's cool. So one more law, idempotence. Idempotence says if I combine x with x and y, it's the same as combining x and y. Okay? In English, this says doing something twice is the same as doing it once. Uh, and this generalizes to doing something any number of times is the same as doing it once. All right? And, and now, if you think, what is the expressive power I gain if my operation is idempotent? All right? and, and the power you get is the ability to not remember and, and not affect correctness. Okay? So if we, uh, if we combine something, right, we don't have to set a Boolean and, and have this global. We don't have to write it to disk. We can just act, do it again. Right? As long as we do it at least once, it's the same as doing it any number of times. Okay? Uh, and ask the mathematicians, what is this thing? It's a bounded semi-lattice, okay? <laughs> a bounded semi-lattice, <laughs> so a bounded semi-lattice is a commutative monoid with this, uh, which means it has commutativity, identity, associativity, it has the binary, closed binary operation, and it also has idempotence, okay? So turns out this thing, this bounded semi-lattice thing, is really, really, really good if you have a distributed system. Okay? And, and I'll touch on something about that. But uh, if you're ever doing some work across a distributed system, if you can morph your work into something that's a bounded semi-lattice, that's good. <laughs> so for visual people, bounded semi-lattice is a subset of all commutative monoids. OK, what's an example of a bounded semi-lattice? Not a sum anymore. 1 plus 1 plus 2 is different than 1 plus 2. So, uh, but taking the max of integers is. Okay? So again, I'm just wrapping up int. And then I'm saying max is a bounded semi-lattice. The empty is the minimum integer, because if I max that with anything, it sort of gets thrown away. Uh, and the operation just invokes the, the swift max function on the two values and then wraps it back up in our struct wrapper. All right? So uh, what can we do? What can we do with fold? All right? We can imp improve the performance again. Okay? So, so uh, for those that don't know, two machines can uh, communicate over the network in several different ways. A popular way is TCP. TCP requires that messages are in order and that they are delivered exactly once. Okay? And if, uh, if, if any of those constraints break, then the connection fails. Uh, and, and unfortunately, these, these constraints add overhead to our, to our delivery mechanism. So it, it, makes, it makes sending messages slow. Okay? But, but these constraints aren't important anymore. All right? So now we can use this other thing, UDP, uh, and, and build a little bit of stuff on top of it, such that we guarantee that all messages are eventually delivered, but we don't care about the order, and we don't care if they're sent more than once. All right? And if we do that, we can make our full disk faster. Okay? And everything else is the same. We can distribute across different phones, use our custom protocol. Every device does some work. We put it back together. We can show results incrementally with a UI, and, and life is good. Okay? <laughs> so, so if you think about it, what do we do? We, we optimize the fold based on the constraints of the problem that were baked into the types via laws. Okay? So, so the, the um, consumer that invokes the fold doesn't have to be aware of the laws. Okay? Um, but because of protocol inheritance in Swift, uh, the, the most optimized fold will be invoked automatically if, if your type conforms to a stronger, more constrained uh, protocol. Okay? Uh, and this is actually a little bit similar to how the standard library does lazy collection uh, transformations. 
which is interesting. Okay, um, <laughs> but <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so, so what I want to stress though is this process is general, all right? The same process we went through today can be used to derive a, a caching library, and I've talked about this a little bit before, so you can click on that or whatever. Um, an animation choreograph library, uh, evented servers, like you can have a server that handles one event uh, and then combine these into servers that can handle all events, right? Uh, you can build an async work cancellation library. I have this in the appendix if you go find these slides. Um, and whatever else you come up with, right? Uh, I, I think this is like a useful way to think about designing APIs, right? And just to prove it, uh, we're going to just quickly, quickly think about composable animation choreographs, OK? So what's an animation choreograph? Uh, it's a thing, I don't know if choreograph is even the right name, but whatever. Uh, think about a splash screen, and like there's an animating dragon or something that flies across, OK? Uh, <laughs> if you, let, let's say that, that's what we want to build, uh, uh, an API for, for constructing those things, right? So the first thing you should do um, is say, is there a magma? Is there a way I can take two of these things and combine them into one, OK? And uh, and there's, there's a, a bunch of ways, uh, but w the one that we're going to talk about is sequencing. So if I, if I translate something and then fade out, right, I can, I can model that as an animation that translates, an animation that fades out, and then I can combine them with our diamond operator. Okay? Um, then the next question, is it associative? Is there a semigroup? Okay? And, and if you think about it, uh, it is. Okay? So, so just follow my fingers. Uh, if I have three animations that I'm sequencing, it doesn't matter if I like, think about these two first or these two first. It's still doing them all one after another. Okay? Uh, and then, is, there, is it a monoid? Is there an identity? And, and there is. Again, uh, an animation of length zero, you can stick it before or after, and it doesn't affect the outcome. The animation still behaves in the same way. All right? And then, is it a commutative monoid? Okay? And, and here, it's not. Because if I first move and then fade out, that looks visually different from fading out first and then moving. Okay? So, so this is not, not true. So, so it's just a monoid, uh, in, given the explanation that I talked about. Okay? Um, and and uh, here's some pseudocode. Okay? So, so we could build a library that looks something like this. Uh, I haven't done that yet. But um, you know, we, we can have this, these like, library of these little primitives, like something that can fade out the background, something that can move something. And then, and then we can build up a compound animation by just combining things. So we can say first fade out the background, then rotate clockwise, then translate. And, and we don't need parentheses because of the associativity. We, we, we give the freedom to the, to the uh, consumers of this API so they don't have to think about how things are parenthesized. Right? Um, and, and actually, animations have a much richer algebraic structure if you think about um, the parallelism as well as, as sequencing and, and how, or sorry, like laying out two animations at the same time. Um, and the way that this, the parallel composition and the sequential composition interact with each other has this neat structure. So you can talk to me after if you're interested, and I'll explain that. Um, but one last thing. Uh, names matter. OK? That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, so um, I, I believe it's important that we have consistent names for these things across not just programming languages like Haskell and Swift, right? but also across disciplines. Okay? Mathematicians have been using these names. Um, and and if, we, if we do use the same names, then we're able to reuse this knowledge, and we're able to share ideas with people outside of our domain, which is really cool. Uh, and uh, I don't know. We should do it. <laughs> so one last time. Um, <laughs> uh, there's a bunch of operations in the world. Some of those are magmas. They're closed binary operations. Some of those are semigroups, associativity, right? Some of those are monoids. They have an identity. Some of those are commutative monoids that commute. And some of those are bounded semi-lattices, which means that I can combine things more than once. And, and if you just want to think about the power, the expressive power I get, okay? here's the same chart. All of my operations, some of those are composable. Composable things are good. Functional programming. All right. Uh, some of those are, give you free parallelization. Okay? Those are semi-groups. Some of those allow you to drop the optional to not think about uh, handling the empty case. That's monoid. Some of those let you reorder the operations. That's commutative monoid. And then bounded semi-lattices give you the ability to not care uh, if you've already done something. You can forget things. All right? So what should you take away? Uh, sorry that I spoke very fast. I had a lot to get, a lot of, lot to get through. Um, but uh, optimal API design is about maximizing simplicity and expressivity. All right? 
Composable APIs maximize these properties. Right? You shouldn't stop at composition because more laws gives you more expressive power without increasing complexity. Because right? I'm measuring complexity as what does the public interface of your library expose. And if, if we're in a universe where all of us can talk about these algebraic structures, monoid, semigroup, whatever, and understand it, then that doesn't increase complexity when we, when we add these law conformances. Okay? And this stuff is actually useful in real life. I hope I, I showed that. Like you can build a folding library. You can think about animations. You can build caches. And you should learn the names. I, I hope you are interested now. Um, you can find them on Wikipedia or talk to math people. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, and you should teach your coworkers and friends because then we can all think about problems at this higher level where uh, when, when we come up with a solution that works on monoids, they work on everything, right? So thanks. Uh, Sorry, I just realized that link is wrong. Uh, so if you want to find this, um, let me show you. Uh, <laughs> that's embarrassing. Um, here, wait, I can go to this screen, and then hopefully I can escape. There we go. And then uh, if you go to github.com, it's actually bcase.github.io slash uh, one of these. Um, we can start raising your hands and stuff for questions. <laughs> um, here it is. So that one. All right. I, I don't have I don't have uh, Wi-Fi, but it's that. So hopefully people can read that. Um, okay. Um, I don't know of a way to take something that's not associative and lift it into something that is associative for free. I bet there is a way, uh, and I bet there are people in this audience who know of a way. But, uh, but I do know, um, uh, for, for other, other versions of these laws, um, you, can, you can take anything that, that doesn't have an identity, and you can wrap it in an optional, and now it has an identity. The identity is nil. Um, as long as you define your operation to work over options in that way. So that's kind of hand wavy, but but you can there there are ways to sort of get the structure for free if you sacrifice the structure of your uh, data. Um, so, any other questions? Bound and Yes. Uh, uh, CRDTs are are a formalism for representing operations that are safe to do in distributed systems. I don't remember the exact definition of a CRDT. But I do remember thinking, uh, when I learned about bounded semi-lattices and CRDTs, I was like, if you think about them as bounded semi-lattices, then it's much easier to reason about, I think. So uh, there is, I think that they're either equivalent or similar enough that, in my opinion, you should be thinking about it from a mathematical standpoint rather than a like arbitrary people made up these rules and CRDT view. So. Okay, so they are they are the same. Okay, cool. So for those that didn't hear, got it. Got it. Okay. For the benefit of the recording, uh, they are, there is a correspondence between CRDTs and bounded semi lattices, and there is work by. Lindsay Cooper on LVARs that talk about this. How did you, I'm trying to, I'm searching, fascinating. How did you get to that? Yeah. That's so cool. How do I keep doing that? Yeah. Uh, how did I do it? So, are you a PhD in that? No. Uh, so actually, um, I'll hopefully go quickly. Uh, I did undergrad, um, and I went to a school. I went to Carnegie Mellon, where they there's functional programming is heavy in our education, but not not Haskell type functional programming. So no no category theory stuff, um, and very little abstract algebra also. Uh, but 
soon after I graduated, and while I was there, I was not even into this stuff. Uh, soon after I graduated, I almost immediately was like, hey, I think we could write programs that are easier to understand if we think more about, um, this, about functional programming, right? And then I just went super deep into functional programming land, deep, 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 and into Haskell or whatever, right? And then I found that abstract algebra, to me, makes a lot more sense than category theory. I want to eventually have a really good understanding of category theory as well. But um, abstract algebra, I think, is easier. And, uh, and this, all this stuff that I talked about today is from abstract algebra. Um, and, uh, and, and then, and then I, I sort of, uh, well, I just, monoids are cool. Learned about those. And, and, I, <laughs> and then I found out that like, this caching library that I was using, that I was like, this is so, like, has such an interesting algebraic structure. There, this has to be a thing, you know? And then I sort of found this correspondence with monoids. And at that point, I was like, all APIs should be thought of in this way. Like, if we can just, if we can just come up with a composable operation and add laws to it, we get this crazy stuff. And then I came up with this talk. Um, so this is relatively recent for me, but I'm excited about it. Uh, Yeah, we should have, yeah, that's a good point. Um, we should have a, uh, <laughs> is it Swift Z? So, um, <laughs> no. Uh, okay, so apparently there, there's a package called Algebra uh, on GitHub. I, I think as a community, we, a, a lot of us, I guess, have to sort of all agree that like, we're all going to take these, this common protocol definitions from somewhere. I know Kickstarter has a, uh, has a, a repo where they, I've looked through their code when they open sourced it, um, has like a, a shared project for, for these structures as well. Um, and, uh, and I think right now we're kind of in a state where um, you have to sort of redo this work of saying like, uh, you know, this is a monoid in my, for my monoid or whatever for all your things, but um, maybe we can get to a world as a programming, as a Swift community where we don't have to do that. In, in, uh, in, Haskell and Scala, um, that's, they're, they're in that universe where everyone has basically decided that this is the, the blessed library that defines these things. Um, there's like one or two of those. And then uh, everyone can sort of reuse things. Um, cool. Any other questions? Or we're out of time. Yeah, that's... Okay. Yeah. Uh, find me later. Yeah. yeah.